This is a Space and ADM Cultural and Political Geographies of Automation session. It's, it's really keyed to the automated production of space uh, work stream in the center. And this is a, a project that's really just starting or just getting underway, which is um, using approaches inflected by critical uh, cultural geography and concerns with the relationship between space and culture as a kind of common meeting ground for approaches to thinking about automation from across a variety of disciplines. The goal here is to think about the ways in which automation uh, manifests itself in transforming, constructing, mapping, reconfiguring, uh, both physical and virtual space. Uh, and we, we found that this uh, approach, thinking about uh, cultural geography, thinking about logics of space and the production and consumption of space, is a, has been a really fruitful and useful way to link a variety of concerns uh, uh, across the center. And so the goal here is to showcase some of the work that is taking place in the center and also build some connections uh, with folks who are working uh, in the area of uh, space and automation and to build the foundation for ongoing collaborations around this topic. And we're hoping that it might also be uh, some source of inspiration to bring people together in the center to think about projects that we might build here. We, we, since we're getting underway, we have room to build out and develop projects. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our great panel today. We have uh, seated in uh, the order they'll be presenting. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Justine Humphrey, who's a senior lecturer in digital cultures in the Department of Media and Communications at the University of Sydney. Uh, Chan Lee is a PhD student in the School of Media, Film and Journalism at Monash University. Kelly Lewis is a postdoctoral research fellow in the School of Media, Film and Journalism at Monash University. James Parker is associate professor at Melbourne Law School. Uh, Rob Sparrow is a professor of philosophy in the philosophy department and an adjunct professor in the Monash Bioethics Center at Monash University. I should say I'm Mark Andreevich, sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm in the School of Media, Film and Journalism at Monash University and one of the CIs in the uh, ARC Center for Automated Decision Making and Society. Uh, and I'll, I'll let uh, each speaker uh, introduce the topic of their talk. And what we're going to do format wise is we'll have uh, each speaker will uh, provide some background and thoughts in relation to work that they're doing that connects themes of automation and space. And then we'll open it up to discussion. So with that, we'll get underway. Thanks, Justine. Thank you. I might just go up here if that's okay. Um, I may have some slides. Uh, or I might be flying solo, um, but if the slides materialize, then um, I will just, yep, yeah, yeah. yeah, here we go, <laughs> fantastic, thank you. So first of all, just like to acknowledge, um, if you just move on to the next slide, the uh, people of the, the land that we gather on, the Wurundjeri people of the Cullen Nations. Uh, now, Michael and Mark, thanks, just next slide is fine, invited the panelists to develop a provocation and response rather than a full paper day because of our full panel. And the idea of my provocation centers on the emergence of algorithmic and automated processes related to the rise of urban datafication, made possible by the embedding of a wide range of sensing objects in urban space, some traditional like benches, but others newer like robots and drones. And to explore what this means and does to public space, and also what it means for groups who, for various reasons, inhabit public space in distinct ways. So if you could just move on to the next slide, that'd be great. The first thing to consider before thinking about what automated decision-making technology does to public space is to understand that public space is itself a highly contested idea. And there are various meanings and experiences of public space for different groups. Doreen Massey famously proposed that space has power geometries in that it is a result of political and social production and that groups have different treatment in that space as a result. The gendered aspects of public space have long, long been a subject of discussion and critique by feminist urban scholars and geographers. People who are unstably housed without secure and safe shelter have a different relationship to public space because of the necessity to inhabit spaces in public and shared zones 
for longer periods of time to rest, to eat, to seek out services, to charge their mobile phones. Gender dynamics also play out within the homeless population. Women often are the least visible subset of a very diverse population of people experiencing homelessness because they tend not to occupy public spaces, but instead couch surf with friends and family, live in cars and caravans and spend nights in refuges. Next, please. Homelessness, especially street homelessness has historically been subject to high levels of policing and urban objects are co-opted into enacting policies to remove, displace and monitor rough sleepers. Digital technologies are also a key means through which different groups are policed in public space. Although it might come as a surprise to you that many acts of enforcement of people who are homeless are driven by complaints. Next, please. So as spaces become increasingly mediated, this also has implications for the mobilities of these groups and the opportunities and challenges of these spaces. For example, in my research uh, that I did um, on smart street furniture in New York City and collaborative research in United Kingdom in Glasgow and London, I found that people experiencing homelessness as well as young people and groups displaced by war and conflict experience high levels of access barriers that in turn produce new imperatives of movement to secure phone, internet access and power. These mobilities are enforced rather than chosen, and they're shaped in ways that are um, differentially um, sort of experienced according to the sort of affordances of cities uh, and also the capacity of particular groups to make claims on material space. At its base, these mediated mobilities are how people who are uh, homeless or otherwise marginalized perform essential relational maintenance, to use BAME's term, checking in, accessing information, consuming entertainment or producing content and obtaining help from their friends, family and um, support workers. But mobile mediation also changes space. So just as space becomes a resource and a place for maintaining the condition of mobile connectivity, it also becomes layered or augmented by data. This invisible data zone, as you are probably familiar with, has been variously described. Kitchen and Dodge have described it as code space. McKenzie suggested the concept of wirelessness. Both of these concepts try to get to the hybrid spatial formations that emerge through the mixing of coded flows with physical space. Smartphone users are familiar with the augmentation of spaces possible by the geolocation data that we generate when we're using Google Maps, Uber, Yelp, TripAdvisor, and so on, while moving through physical space. Facebook has very ambitious goals with its metaverse to augment space um, you know, virtually with its um, ecosystem of different social media platforms and immersive technologies. Next, please. One way that space is becoming transformed through its mediation and datification in a very mundane way is by embedding sensing technologies in street objects and furniture like kiosks, benches, and light poles. And these collect data. And this data is then subject to automated and algorithmic processing to change some aspect or feature of that space. So the Link NYC kiosks in New York City and in the UK have these outward facing connectivity and information services, and they generate data through people's interaction with them. But they also have internal sensors and actuators uh, that together are networked to create a sensor array. So if you have you know, many of these throughout city spaces, they can create a different kind of space and generate different kinds of data and affordances of data as well. So these objects form part of a larger network. And to give you an example of how that data can be used, counts of Wi-Fi enabled mobile devices are used as central insights for the location aware advertising that is displayed on these large sided double um, digital displays. Um, so I think I can move on now. So like the in-link kiosks, these strawberry energy smart benches combine a variety of connectivity services. 
Uh, but they also have a range of internal sensors that collect information about the environment, air, temperature, humidity, sound, pollution. And one of the outcomes of datafication is that algorithm, algorithms that function literally at the level of the street, so drawing on the code space that's generated by these objects, create new possibilities for making groups visible in that space through the generation of data, not only by being captured by video footage, but also being acted on in particular ways through that data. So this is what I mean by street level algorithm. And as I'm using it, I'm building on Lipsky's term of street level bureaucracy, which he refers to as the layer of bureaucracy that directly interacts with people. So police forces, transportation, courts, schools, shops, and so on. So look, I just want to give one kind of wrapping up example to illustrate how this sort of algorithmic production of sp a space can actually imp impact on people in very direct ways. Um, this is one particular algorithmic technology that was introduced into the Inlink kiosks in Lon London. Um, and what actually happened is that in 2018, uh, early 2019, um, this particular kiosk was found to be being used um, very frequently, up to 20,000 calls a month for um, alleged use for um, drug supply and um, drug dealing over a four month period. It's located in a very um, ethnically diverse area of London, South London called Tower Hamlets. Um, and so in a sense, the kind of affordances of the free phone calling, which is built into the product, was being ways, uh, used in ways that was not intended by the designers. And in response uh, to pressure by council and police, Inlink UK and British Telecom um, developed and installed a call blocking algorithm in the units, which um, used a range of different indicators, including frequency of calls, how long calls lasted and insights provided by authorities um, in order to be able to block particular kinds of calls that were being made from those units. And in this way, they were sort of automatically shaping the space around it. Um, but one of the interesting things, I think, and notable things to note about this is that it was rolled out without any kind of community discussion um, or evaluation of its long-term implications. And really the kind of politics of the algorithm remain hidden and black boxed, even though they now afford new kinds of possibilities of automatic predictive policing and surveillance. So this here, sorry, is a picture of where the in-link um, kiosk that had the core blocking algorithm installed is located. It's now been uh, sort of packaged and branded as an antisocial behaviour package, which has been rolled out to all of the in-link kiosks in throughout the United Kingdom. So instead of kind of getting the community involved in trying to understand whether this was in fact the best or only solution for dealing with the kinds of issues that were really a function of poverty in that particular neighbourhood, police acting in concert with technology suppliers locked out the community from any involvement in their own affairs over the algorithmic solution that was implemented. So street level algorithms are not just street level. So there are different vertical and horizontal scales of algorithmic technologies that you know, allow space to be seen and sensed from above, from the side, from underneath. And so you know, drones have been used to monitor homeless encampments. In Japan, a drone equipped with thermal cameras was used to record the temperature of people living there. I'm not entirely sure why. CCTV footage in combination with other forms of mobile data, such as from smartphones and cameras and robots in public space, are all combined in various ways to provide these kind of new predictive and surveillance capacities through the extensification of exploitable code space. And as Taylor has cautioned, and you, you may be familiar with her work, she has written a lot in the area of data justice, um, the, the real caution here or that the problem is that this carries with it the dual risk of rendering certain groups invisible and also misinterpreting what is visible. Okay, so I'm just going to pretty much end on that, but make one final comment that 
these sort of predictive and surveillance affordances of street level algorithms are not necessarily restricted to their use by police. And in fact, I'm reminded here of how some in the homelessness space have argued that surveillance can have positive outcomes and can be used to support people to, to get out of homelessness and access support in a, in a more um, direct and a way. So it's a way to reach groups who might otherwise be unreachable. But what is key here is that they can be used and are being used for policing particular kinds of groups and that their existence supports an emerging paradigm of policing and law enforcement that Mark has written about um, quite extensively that uses data secured through wide range of urban systems for targeting, profiling and predictive policing of social groups. And if you're interested in finding out more about this topic, I have a, uh, sorry, just a little quick plug here, a book coming out at the end of the year, um, Precariously Connected, Homelessness and Mobile Communication. And I'd be very happy to share more of the insights on my research with you through that book. Please feel free to get in touch with me and thank you so much. Thank you so much. The next speaker is Tran Lee. Thank you. Hey, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming here. Um, as Mark mentioned, my name is Zhang, and I am a PhD candidate at Monash University. So what brought me to this space and ADM panel started with my PhD research in various initiatives that use crowdsourced data to map gender violence in public space in order to address it. So just for example, just a week ago, Victorian police launched a reporting platform in order for the public to notify them of any unwanted sexual behavior happening on public transport in order to, for them to, uh, as they mentioned, uh, inform resource tasking to deter offenders. So when I look at these various initiatives that uh, you know, take a data-driven approach to gendered violence in public space, I happened to find out that lots of them are also developing, um, you know, what they call AI-powered solution to gender violence. So my talk today uh, will be drawing on from an example of the use of computer vision algorithm to make space safer for women. Specifically, I want to talk about a social tech company called Safety Ping which develop an app to collect social and physical aspect, uh, to collect data about social and physical aspect of space in order to determine the safety level of space. Um, it was launched in India in 2013 after a highly publicized case of a gang rape of a medical student in Delhi. And since then it's been available in 60 cities around the world, which is quite um, a global company now. But even so, it was struggling to get enough users to submit uh, their evaluation of space uh, for every corner of the street in order to cover the whole cities in the uniform manner. So what did it, uh, what, uh, what it did is, um, you know, to be a machine learning model um, that can extract and detect certain features from photographs taken from public space. So instead of asking users to go through a lens, as um, the Victorian police is doing, uh, what they do instead is asking users to submit only the photographs of the physical space. And the algorithm is going to uh, extract information that can be used to infer the safety level of space. Uh, features such as, you know, are there any lighting in the environment? Um, is uh, the space crowded or not? What is the condition of the pavement? And they use these features uh, as proxy indicators to uh, determine safer spaces. So the way they collect these data are from user submission, but there's also another way uh, of data collection, which is also highly automated. So they partner with uh, Uber and other taxi companies in order to place the mobile phone on the windscreen of the car and automatically take picture of the surrounding environment as the car moves along. So um, after they detecting certain features on the photographs, they're gonna compute the safety score 
for, for the area in which the photographs were taken. This safety score has several applications. The first one is navigation, uh, safe navigation function for users. So let's say there are five different routes that can be used to reach the same destination. So upon user's query, uh, the app is going to um, interact with these five routes and show users which one is the safest. They also provide the safety data to authority so that they can make decisions on the timings and um, you know, areas of their patrolling. So pre uh, predictive policing as uh, we know it. Uh, there's no shortage of examples of uh, neighborhood gram apps and predictive policy technologies that are you know, similarly using an um, algorithm to draw connection between place, uh, people, events, um, uh, historical crime rate, users' evaluation of space in order to determine um, when and where crime are um, most likely to happen. So these predictive policy technologies have been widely criticized by many scholars uh, because of their potential to perpetuate a cycle of discrimination against racialized and um, underprivileged group, as Sophia Noble um, called it by techno technological redlining. Um, so imagine a scenario where uh, an impoverished neighborhood might have you know, broken light, poor uh, pavement, uh, which uh, can be detected by the algorithm as uh, being an unsafe space, which uh, determine the policing priorities, which then you know, create uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy where more policing lead to more arrests and then more policing. So in this case, data um, collected, um, um, the data are the product of structurally unequal power relations um, and the use of these data could engender more inequalities. Why bias and discriminations are important and unresolved issues. Um, in my provocation today, I'm trying to expand the parameters of this debate by pointing to what I think equally radical implication. So I argue that the use of machine learning to read and rate and classify space not only could result in biases, discriminations, inaccuracies, but fundamentally reconceptualize our understanding of space and shape our imaginations about how to address uh, spatial justice and gender violence in public space. We can see that at the heart of these classifications of safe and unsafe space um, are classification issue. So these classification are made indirectly using proxy indicators such as lighting, pavement, uh, crowd, as if space has a kind of physical objectivity. But as uh, Justin Anche alluded to in her um, in her talk, um, various feminist geographers such as Doreen Massey has long argued that space is not objective, is that it's the product and extension of social relations and, and political relations. Space and spatial justice has been at the heart of family struggle. Um, a lot of family analysis have focused on you know, how space is not um, remains the domain of men. But at the same time, various black feminists also pointed out that space is not for every man, but rather reserved for white men. For example, Angela Davis um, pointed out to the creation of the uh, black rapist myth, whereby black men uh, were positioned as the violent other and were scapegoated in order to hide the true problem of sexual assault against black women by white men. She also pointed out that it's not just sexism, but also racism and the class structure of a capitalist society that provide incentive for rape. So why her analysis is specific to the US context is demonstrated the fact that space is the product and extensions of social relations, that the meaning of space is the product interactions between human actors and can only be understood through situated and qualitative and contextual analysis. But the operational gaze of computer vision, um, as Mark has termed in one of his paper about smart cameras, is striking precisely because it attempts to bypass, you know, deliberation and discussion on the complexities of social um, 
on the complexities of the social context of space and instead to raise space through proxy indicators that are deemed to be objective. It's significant to note that uh, safety ping and its computer vision algorithm is supported by many high profile international organizations. For example, it was funded by the Global Innovation Fund of UNICEF. The International Development Innovation Alliance has a scaling framework from one to six to raise social tech companies ranging from um, idea, uh, research and development, um, proof of concept, uh, uh, ready to transition to scale, uh, scaling and sustainable scale. So it raised safety ping and the use of computer vision to raise space on number four, which means safety ping is ready to transition to scale. Admit the shrinking resources for the welfare sector, it's not surprising that you know, scalability plays such an important role in the evaluation of any solution to social issue. There is no place for tedious, qualitative, situated, and contextual understanding of um, the re relationalities of space. So I just wanted to end my talk here by briefly touching on what this might mean for, um, I think, um, the struggle for equal access to public space and uh, for spatial justice more broadly. Um, I have an encountered an um, investor in an AI company mentioned that AI is a hammer that can be applied to anything. But if you, the tool you only have is the hammer, you're going to treat everything as if it were a nail. So instead of trying to understand space and the kind of social relations that might make space safe or unsafe, AI and computer vision on the code process and classify state. Consequently, sexual violence and more broadly, the struggle for spatial justice is turned into a mere classification and prediction issue. Uh, which place is safe, which place is not safe, when and where violence is likely to occur. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next presenter, presenter is Kelly Lewis. So I'd like to begin firstly by acknowledging the diverse peoples of the Kulin nations and to their past, uh, their, sorry, the oldest past, present and emerging, and also extend that respect to First Nations and Indigenous people joining us online. So my provocation calls for a rethinking of platforms in spatial terms and the need to consider the exterior and the opaque relationships that platforms share with government and oppressive actors. This is especially significant in an era of increasing anti-protest laws and deteriorating civic space. And when governments and oppressive actors are increasingly asserting their authority over platforms to comply with social media censorship and surveillance, resulting in a deepening repression of critical commentary, political dissent and marginalized populations. When platforms intervene by governing the modes of access to uh, political expression and participation, they not only redefine the boundaries of what constitutes the political for entire digital populations, they reframe and re-spatialize traditional assemblages of geopolitics, configure new spaces of social spatial struggle, and produce new power struggles and claims for sovereignty between governments, citizens, and corporations. So today I wanna to focus on really interrogating the ways that platforms deploy necropolitical tools to govern the management of digital populations and to make sense of the co-presence of life and death that manifests most visibly between citizens and non-citizens and those who can be stripped of citizenship in platform spaces. So my discussion is informed by critical platform studies together with theorizing from Cameroonian political theorist, Asalima Membe's concept of necropolitics. And it builds on my research uh, of unjust social media censorship of pro-Palestinian voices during the 11-day Israeli-Palestinian conflict in May last year. Briefly, for those unfamiliar with the conflict, hostilities intensified across the occupied Palestinian territories following the violent repression of protests against the forced eviction of Palestinian refugee families living in the East Jerusalem neighborhood of Sheikh Jarrah 
and worsened when the Israeli police brutally stormed and blockaded the Alaska Mosque. The violence played out across social media as pro-Palestinian voices shared imagery of brutalized bodies, collapsing buildings and armed conflict to global audiences. And yet this content was routinely removed by platforms in direct collaboration with the Israeli state through various forms of content moderation processes and uh, policies that were extremely controversial and opaque. So I'm gonna briefly just structure my talk today by offering a bit of a primer on the Mimbe's theory of necropolitics for those unfamiliar with it. And then I'll introduce my concept of platform necropolitics. And then I'll conclude with a brief discussion of why this offers a promising uh, avenue for future research. So Membe first developed the notion of necropolitics in a 2003 essay, and he then expanded upon this in the 29 Eng English publication on the book Necropolitics. In his broader conceptualization of necropolitics, Membe adopts a decolonized approach inspired by the work of Franz Fanon, and he radicalizes Michel Foucault's notion of biopolitics and biopower. So Foucault's important analytics of biopower examine the way that a new governing strategy uh, arose in the late 18th century, focused really on the regulation of populations and the management of life known as biopolitics. That is the right of the state to exercise power to let live and make die. Mimbe coins the terms necropower and necropolitics to argue that biopower and biopolitics are now or cannot adequately describe or theorize the contemporary processes and the asymmetrical relations through which forms of political and social power now subjugate life to the power of death. That is, necropolitics questions who must live and who is let die. Death and making die are what structures living. So importantly, Membe highlights how necropolitics manifest in a plurality of forms. And he argues that we are now in an era conceptualized through the ongoing redefinition of the human as a digital subject, aided by the power and ubiquity of computational digital technologies. He contends there's no separation that exists now between the screen and life, that life now transpires on the screen, and that the screen is now the plastic and the simulated form of living that in addition can be grasped by code. And I think this is a really key principle to consider because if we conceptualize platforms as spaces that we live in, with, and through, and it causes us really to reflect on what is at stake when access to digital citizenship becomes reborderized by platforms that boundary make spaces and states of inclusion and exclusion, and where technologies of violence have become more sensorial, more extractive and precision targeted. So from this line of thinking, I've developed the term platform necropolitics as an explicit vocabulary to really articulate the struggle for the life, uh, for the right to life online and freedom of expression. Platform necropolitics speaks to emerging and troubling developments of digitally mediated violence, that is, when platforms exercise the power to effectively let digital subjects live or to kill contentious content and voices of dissent. This manifests in various situations and especially when platforms work in coordination with governments to expedite the removal of content that is deemed offensive, graphic or insightful, particularly those which are legitimate forms of political expression and that do not violate platform policies or community guidelines. And this has specific consequences for freedom of expression and it also, and human rights, but also governs the condition under which we see, understand, and remember conflict and revolt. So conceptualizing platforms as necro-political spaces creates an alternative reading of platform politics to emphasize the implication of their discursal, discursive, their material, and geospatial interventions. It also complica complicates conventional understanding of necropolitics as manifesting largely in the states and spaces of exception, such as the plantation, the colony, refugee camps, and the occupied Palestinian territories, by expanding these spaces of necropolitical violence to include ordinary social spaces like platforms that operate as lawless intermediaries when they reproduce states of insecurity. This is especially crucial for already at-risk bodies living at the margin and within domains of excessive struggle. By necropolitical violence, I mean the mediated violence of platforms that operate as imagined sovereign actors with the violent policing of the boundaries of space and that take as their object, the digital subject, and act their right to kill. Killing in this sense is digitally mediated. It materially and discursively relegates digital subjects as undesirable others and differentially consigns, 
certain populations toward a perpetual state of vulnerability and finitude. It consigns other digital subjects to spaces of social irreproducibility and social death. So in concluding, if we come to think as social life becoming increasingly embedded in new and emerging virtual spaces, and yes, towards the idea of the so-called metaverse, continuing to trouble the ways that we think about and interrogate traditional notions of citizenship and sovereignty in these spaces is really ne necessary. Future virtual worlds will be built on already existing problematics and it will recalibrate the dynamics between nation states, corporations and people in increasingly complex ways. Where life and death struggles persist alongside automated futures, we should be very cautious of the enduring digital utopianism that the metaverse may bring forward new promises for freedom and transparency across borders. And as I've discussed, digitally mediated and virtual spaces already give rise to new forms of social and spatial relations and to the exercising of sovereignty as the ultimate expression of necropolitical power. Access to digital citizenship and social participation is increasingly administered through the automated logics and modes of algorithmic authorization that expulses certain bodies from the platform on the basis of the threat that they pose to the social order and relegates them to spaces of non-citizenship as an alleged security violation solution, sorry. So algorithmic borderization is a process by which platform necropolitical, ne necropolitical power transforms particular spaces into impassable zones for certain populations of people and transposes them to dead spaces of non-connection, which denies the idea of a very, very much a shared humanity. Thank you. The next speaker is James Parker. The title, I, I, we haven't been saying the titles, have we? It says, uh, listening to everything, everywhere, all of the time, forever. <laughs> <laughs> On that upbeat note. Um, I also <laughs> want to begin by acknowledging country and uh, also noticing the incompatibility, probably a fundamental incompatibility of the account of space I'm going to um, draw your attention to today and indigenous uh, epistemologies of space and country. Um, in March this year, um, as you probably don't know, <laughs> a team of researchers led by a prominent computer scientist at Imperial College London posted a preprint on archive.org. It is entitled Climate Change and Computer Audition, a Call to Action and Overview on Audio Intelligence to Help Save the Planet. And here it is. And the paper is essentially a list of every conceivable way the authors can think of where computer audition or machine listening might be able to deliver value to save the planet. And here the paper is organized around the classical elements of ancient Greek, Persian and Indian philosophy. So earth, water, air, fire. And the list is extremely long. I won't, I won't, um, but just so, sort of to, just to give you a quick flavor under the heading earth, for instance, we learn that computer audition could be used to detect early signs of earthquakes, to identify and monitor animal populations based on their vocalizations, and to assess plant stress based on ultrasonic emissions correlated with a variety of environmental factors, insect movement, feeding and mating activities to preempt and prevent infestation. When it comes to water, computer audition could hear cracking ice in the polar ice caps before these cracks appear visually, and so predict um, and prevent avalanches and floods. It could monitor water flow velocity in rivers using hydrophones to predict and preempt floods and water scarcity. In the air, machine listening technologies could classify and track bird populations. Acoustical non-intrusive sensors could be used to track bee colonies and other flying insects. Automatic infrasound monitoring and classification can be used apparently to determine um, tornado genesis and properties. Finally, under the heading fire, machine listening can apparently be used to determine the location of lightning strike sources and to track and classify bushfires based on their acoustic features. It can be used to determine the nature and extent of structural damage to buildings that have experienced fire damage to, for instance, identify the degree of degradation of fiber cement boards. In fact, 
computer audition can be used to monitor abnormal noises in man-made infrastructures more generally, in motorways, airports, railways, as these respond to and are damaged by climate change moving forward. It can be used to monitor traffic noise, both as a proxy for air pollution and to better track and understand noises, emotional effects on um, animals and humans. And there are many, many, many more examples in the paper. But what the paper does is having established these many ways in which machine listening might be used to analyze environmental audio data, um, it, it argues that the next step would be to equip our intelligent audio systems with a transmission module as well, thus converting it from a passive sensing module to an agent capable of interacting with its environment. In response to noise pollution, the authors advocate open space active noise cancellation to identify and cancel unwanted noise sources in the environment using similar techniques to the ones in your Bose headphones. And with respect to animals, the, the authors propose drawing on work in human computer interaction to develop and roll out machine to animal communication systems. Alarm systems for animals, they say, distributed auditory intelligences to alert animals to the presence of wildfire or other hazards. This would, of course, involve teaching AIs to speak various animal languages, which the authors admit is a challenging topic. That's a quote. But it can probably be, probably be solved, they say, using reinforcement learning. So that, according to one of the most senior figures in the field, and I want to stress that, is how audio intelligence can help save the planet. And my provocation or question for us is, how do we respond to a claim like this? Even if the paper is in a way a bad object, as evidenced by your laughs, even if from a critical perspective, it's slightly embarrassing, literally too easy to critique, right? Even if it's never cited and never rolled out, I do think it's worth pausing to reflect on uh, how radical it is actually. Because what's being imagined in this paper is a form of audio monitoring much more pervasive than anything ever imagined by the NSA, much deeper and more extensive than anything dependent on satellites or drones, literally the embedding of networked microphones everywhere, land, sea, skies, the entire biosphere, and the automatic monitoring and responding to more or less all human and non-human sounds all of the time forever, or at least until humans die out. What is being imagined and advocated, in other words, is the convergence of environmentalism with what Mark has called environmentality, that is, a mode of governance applied to the environment, now in the name of the environment. And not just that, the authors make the case that audio is a particularly good sensing modality if you wanna do this kind of environmentality because it is more efficient in terms of data throughput than image or video monitoring. It can cover huge areas, they say, and monitor omnidirectionally, including at night and in the presence of smoke or other visual impediments. Machine listening can apparently cope um, better with machine vision with, um, with informational richness. Microphones are cheap, they're small, they're easy to install and replace, and they require relatively little energy to run. So what the authors say is that if you want to monitor literally everything all of the time, everywhere, forever, computer audition is the best way to do it. And the long version of the paper, I spend some time situating this claim in relation to the field's history, machine listening's history, and specifically the moment in the 1990s when research on machine listening starts to move on from its historical focus on speech and music to concern itself with real, real world sounds in space. So it's really in the 90s that for the first time the soundscape, um, the sonorous space, becomes an object of computational concern. I think this paper can be read as a kind of a radicalization of that project effectively. Um, the extension of the comp computation and analysis of soundscapes to all soundscapes, to the planetary soundscape, to the planet as soundscape, and just given a kind of environmentalist gloss now. And maybe in discussion, we can um, spend some time thinking about what this kind of historical framing might offer, if anything. But in a nutshell, what I think is that it decenters the big data AI hype surveillance capitalism framing just a little bit. 
to sort of place the, the, the one of the key moments in the 1990s because, uh, and that's worth doing because the authors make the claim, and I kind of saved the best to last, that we should start thinking of AI as the fifth element, ether, the essence of things discrete from the physical world made of the air breathed by the Olympic gods. And I'm not even joking. And that's part of the story, of course it is. Um, but it also and underestimates the extent to which a paper like this is also and importantly an expression of good old fashioned scientific hubris and imperialism with as much in common with the history of the air pump or solar geoengineering as smart homes and facial recognition. Imperialism, as the anti-colonial STS scholar Shiv Vishwanathan once put it, is not merely the logic of capitalism, but also the charter of science. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rob Sparrow. His title is Pigs in Space, which will resonate with a particular generation of listeners. Pigs in Space. <laughs> the Muppets. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mark. And I'm pleased to see there, I think there's going to be some connections between this presentation and the previous one, in particular in the way in which um, human, non-human animal relationships are often rolled out in debates about AI uh, in really interesting ways. Uh, so I want to talk about a current research interest, which is related to an ARC discovery project uh, I was funded in the last round, which is on the uh, ethical issues raised by the use of robotics and AI. Uh, in agriculture. I'm an applied ethicist rather than a uh, geographer, uh, though I have done some work on uh, driverless vehicles and transport justice. Uh, there's actually lots of spatial implications of um, AI and robotics in agriculture uh, in terms of um, farm size uh, in particular, uh, the rural urban relationships and the relationship between human beings and the natural world uh, more generally. And there's an interesting subset of issues which relate to uh, non-human animals and the, and the place of non-human animals uh, in space. And animal welfare arguments are actually trotted out regularly as a sort of, um, uh, I think, as a, as a Trojan horse for the introduction of the use of, um, of AI into animal uh, agriculture. So in his 2020 book, um, Porkopolis, Alex Blanchette uh, talks about the way in which uh, industrial pork production constructs the relationship between uh, human and animals, uh, human and non-human animals. And one of the most interesting figures uh, in that book, and I can't recommend it highly enough if you're interested in, in uh, uh, in animals or food production, this book, Porkopolis, is a real eye-opener. Uh, but he talks about the way in which the management of industrial uh, pork facilities and indeed, which now encompass their local, uh, the local towns, uh, these big intensive animal productions essentially reorient all life locally uh, towards what's happening in, uh, inside the facilities. The managers of these facilities uh, now talk about uh, what they call the herd. So they're no longer interested in individual animals and they make a distinction between the ordinary workers who deal with individual animals and the managers who deal with the herd. Uh, the herd, capital H, is an abstract representation of the flow of animal life through the facilities. Uh, and it extends from before birth because they're concerned with the breeding of the animals and after death because they're uh, concerned with the marketing uh, of the products of the bodies uh, of the animals. So through the figure of the herd, pigs are the life cycle of the pig is essentially smeared out through space. This is an abstract entity represented in spreadsheets. Uh, the total uh, sort of uh, living potential and economic potential uh, of these animals as, uh, uh, as connected to global markets around the world. So there's a fantastic discussion about how the fate of these animals in America is linked to the price of ramen in Japan, that via these spreadsheets, 
there's a market signal in Japan and these American pork production facilities uh, change uh, the way the number of animals they breed, the sort of animals they breed and how they're slaughtered. So you get this really interesting smearing uh, of the animal uh, through space. Uh, it's a model for a particularly dystopian vision of population-based uh, policy uh, more generally. I'll make some remarks about that uh, at the end. What does adding AI to this do? Well, there's actually an enormous amount of um, AI now being applied to animal agriculture, uh, animal geno like genomics, big data and genomics, uh, genetic modification of animals, uh, massively uh, influenced by machine learning, Stock market is increasingly uh, automated. Uh, driverless logistics will make a huge difference to agriculture if that ever uh, gets off the ground. Uh, yield prediction systems or disease modeling systems now shape uh, decisions uh, made on farms, including in animal agriculture. People are moving towards what they call precision feeding and precision medicine. So you're using an AI system to deliver individual doses specific doses of drugs and food to individual animals. Uh, one of the, <laughs> there's an application of a surveillance, camera surveillance systems now in intensive agriculture uh, with the goal of detecting behavioral change in animals that might be indicative of disease or perhaps animal suffering, uh, which perhaps you might do something uh, about. Uh, the notion that people want to know about the fate of their food from farm to fork is now being mediated through the blockchain. So you can, there's a possible future where you can actually really know, you know, where your uh, mints come from uh, via the blockchain. Uh, and of course, surveillance systems are now used to keep animal rights activists out of these facilities. You know, smart cameras on the exterior of these uh, facilities is one way of keeping. Uh, people out. So all of these technologies applied to the herd, I think are going to do some really interesting things. They're going to um, make it more virtual and also cyborg uh, it, where, where the herd becomes more uh, mobile in both space uh, and time. Now there's a tension between the metaphor of cyborg and the metaphor of the virtual, one's bodily, uh, one's sort of trans bodily. Uh, metaphor, but there's clearly this, this abstract representation of animality is going to become uh, much more mobile, uh, active and uh, virtual. It's going to be simultaneously more totalizing and more individualized. So the herd can become larger, but it can also become more focused on particular facilities or particular uh, uh, lo locations or breeds of animals more and more transnational uh, in nature. I think it'll also separate humans and non-human animals. We're already massively separated from the animal world, but if you imagine a future of sort of lights out animal production, uh, where they're entirely um, monitored by machines, fed by robots, shipped in driverless vehicles, you can imagine a near total separation of human beings uh, and the creatures uh, we eat. Um, and I also think this will change the narratives that we use to understand our relationship with non-human animals. I mean, we've always related to non-human animals through narratives, but the narratives that arise through datafication are a different set uh, of narratives um, in ways that I think are interesting. You know, it's always tempting to speculate about the implications for human beings of what's happening to non-human uh, animals. You have to be really careful, uh, careful with that move uh, because, um, Obviously, human and the non-human are, are defined in opposition to each other, uh, and certain people are always being uh, analogized with their animal nature. But I do think there's a similar set of technologies emerging uh, in certain total institutional environments. So you think about refugee politics, hospitals, prison populations, the way big data drives an emphasis on population. Uh, I actually think there will be you know, we can learn something from the future of pigs in space uh, for what it means uh, for us uh, uh, for us to be located in space. Now, finally, there's an emerging understanding in bioethics made very clear in the pandemic. The framework is called One Health, where human health and animal health are intimately related. What's happening to non-human animals in food markets in China 
impacts on us. So another reason for thinking about the future of pigs in space is this will have connections with our welfare in the future. I look forward to questions and remarks. Thanks so much. And finally, uh, we have Michael Richardson, who will be talking about droning public space. Uh, thanks, Mark. Um, I'll try and be quick so we have more time for discussion. Um, so the topic of my provocation today, drone delivery and the droning of shared skies, um, is in many ways uh, yet another um, imposition on country. And so I too want to acknowledge um, that we're on unceded uh, Wurundjeri land today. Um, and that drone delivery, like so many other advances in technology and um, new forms of mobility, uh, depends on those old tried and tested colonial tools of cartography, property rights, and the government regulation of land, and in this case, sky. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is also very indebted to my collaborators, um, Tao Fan and Jake Goldenfine, um, who can't join us today, but I'm sure I'm well known to many of you. Um, so wing drone delivery is a wholly owned subsidiary of Alphabet, Google's parent company, and it has been operating uh, trial sites in Australia for um, almost three years now. Um, it, first in Canberra and now in uh, Brisbane in Logan. Um, on uh, Wings, um, ordering system, you can basically order very small items, a cup of coffee, a burrito, um, maybe some Panadol if you've got a bit of a headache in the morning, or as its promotional material demonstrates, a jar of Vegemite um, if you can't quite make the kids sandwiches um, on the way to school. Um, Wing is very much pitched to a particular uh, vision of middle Australia. Um, the, the promotional um, ads are kind of uh, very enjoyable in this regard. Um, you get the, the dad preparing um, uh, the, the kids' lunches, running out of Vegemite, hopping on the app, and um, within a few minutes, there's a jar of Vegemite spiraling down from the sky, um, and uh, lunchtime and the morning is saved. Um, Last year, Wing celebrated 100,000 um, orders across its two test sites in Australia. And in March, they announced a partnership. This year, they announced a partnership with Coles um, to trial an expanded grocery list. And just recently, they've announced um, more trials and expanded operations around the world. So while Wing is um, a global company and has had trials in other places, Australia has been a critical uh, test site um, for, for Wing. And, um, there's probably several reasons to that, um, uh, in, including um, its capacity to have a close relationship with the Civil Aviation Safety Authority, CASA, um, and the enthusiasm of um, our Department of um, Industry and Innovation to uh, get behind these types of initiatives. Um, as some of you may know, um, some areas in Australia um, have uh, dedicated strategies to develop drone industries. Queensland, for example, um, has a drones strategy um, and they are undertaking a range of initiatives in the civil space and also in the military area. Um, so in the way Wing pitches itself, it often um, describes what it does in terms of speed and sustainability um, and the convenience of customers. Um, but, the, but today I wanna suggest that there's a fair bit more at stake and a lot hidden behind um, those particular claims and promises. Uh, so um, the way Wing works is very familiar to anyone who's used um, any kind of um, short ordering delivery app. You download something on your phone, um, you open up the app, uh, it gives you a range of options for ordering. Um, you su submit the order. Uh, and then what happens is that order gets directed to an appropriate um, base station. At the base station, your delivery is um, loaded into a specially designed container um, that is attached to a drone. The drone takes off, um, it flies autonomously um, to its location. That autonomous flight is monitored by a human pilot um, who is, um, uh, in theory, monitoring multiple flights at the same time and intervenes if and when necessary. Um, so they the pilot has to be quite um, highly trained, um, but the technology is supposed to be doing a lot of, a lot of the work um, uh, itself. Um, when it gets to its location, uh, a, a winch lowers down the delivery box um, and self-releases, and then you can go and collect your uh, little container with um, your jar of Vegemite in it um, from, from your driveway. Um, 
Now, there's several things going on here uh, in, in drone delivery. Um, some of them are very familiar from um, other aspects of application of automation um, in different fields. So um, labor is displaced and made invisible here. Um, it's another example in some ways of, um, of photomation um, or fake automation, where uh, there is a whole lot of labor going on, packing up your um, packing up your order or preparing the food, um, the local cafes and businesses and so on that might be um, uh, in partnership with Wing have to provide um, you know, the, the food or, or other um, items to the base station, et cetera, et cetera. You just don't see um, any of that labor, um, even less so than when you use a service like Deliveroo. Um, there's ripple effects of, of the way this uh, the service operates, much like the Amazon effect, where um, delivery times are put under immense pressure and so shrink down um, to, to minutes rather than hours. So uh, Wing promises like 10 minute delivery, um, which is similar now actually to what gets promised by companies like Milk Run um, and other new entrants in the grocery delivery game. Uh, but um, its fastest recorded delivery time um, is two minutes and 47 seconds. So we're talking about extremely fast delivery potentially. Um, now, um, I think one of the things that's interesting about the, the trials of this technology so far is that they're happening in very carefully chosen urban environments, what I kind of think of as like cooperative um, urban geographies where uh, they're flat, they're open, they're low density. Um, there's not a lot of obstruction from trees and other natural um, features. The buildings are all of a fairly similar height. Um, and the spaces between buildings and the roadways themselves are all broad and open. So from a um, technical operation perspective, they're much easier to deal with than say a downtown environment like we're, we're in now. Um, and I think that's really quite interesting um, when you contrast that to kind of some of the speculative imaginaries of these types of technologies, which are often put forward as operating in exactly these types of urban spaces. Like you pop out on your balcony and there'll be a little uh, drone delivery dock and the drones will whiz over and, um, and deliver your food to you or whatever. Um, but but in, in the actual practice of how they're being rolled out now, that's nothing that, um, the case and in uh, other implementations by companies like Walmart um, in the US, they're also being rolled out in similar like suburban and exurban areas where, um, where the technical challenges are much lower and perhaps where people um, don't have uh, other convenient options for, um, for obtaining goods in short order. So, so drones are more appealing. Um, and uh, a critical dimension here though, is that, that these drone delivery services are also a, um, a real intervention into aerial ecologies. And some of you would probably be familiar with um, stories from the trials here in um, Australia and in Canberra where um, local ravens were attacking the delivery drones and taking them out of the, the sky, our heroes. Um, and so, uh, um, but you know, that, that sort of speaks to the, the, the kind of potential impacts on ecologies that are not necessarily um, uh, going to be well anticipated. Um, so when people think about the problem of delivery drones and the idea of these annoying things whirring through the sky, um, or perhaps the appeal of them um, as providing um, you know, fast service, we're also talking about a transformation of skyways that will impact non-human animals as well as our own um, experience of the spaces that, um, that we live in. Um, skies are not neutral spaces, of course, um, as empty as they might seem to, um, uh, to companies that want to take advantage of them in this way. And so um, the, the critical thing I think that's going on here too is that like um, the drone delivery is not actually just about uh, having fast delivery and even just doing drone delivery. Um, I think that what... Um, Wing is trying to do here in Australia um, is compete in a much bigger game, which is not about how fast we can get things to us, um, uh, how, how fast we can get our Vegemite in the morning, but about how um, the skies are transformed into um, a zone of like low level aerial traffic and who gets to control that, who sets the standards um, and, uh, and, and what that then means for the way those skies are regulated and managed and accessed by other, other players. So really what Wing is trying to do, um, and they are not alone in this, is really test out an unmanned traffic 
aerial traffic management system. Um, and here is where like automation moves from being about like where your order goes um, or about how the drone flies and instead becomes about what the skies are and how they are modulated and controlled um, by autonomous systems. So if you're going to, if you imagine a future, a potential future in which this, this skies have multiple drones whizzing around them for various purposes, maybe delivery, but maybe also environmental monitoring, perhaps attached with um, microphones or, or whatever, um, uh, or for policing and so on and so forth. Um, the skies get uh, congested and complicated pretty quickly. And so who having automated systems that, uh, that um, ensure public safety, that limit um, the capacity of drones to go into certain spaces, that manage collision avoidance autonomously becomes super important. And who gets to control those standards and what, how those standards get embedded in, um, in government regulation, government practice um, becomes critical. And so the Civil Aviation Safety Authority in Australia um, and like like its counterparts across the world is looking to industry to tell them how to do this stuff because they don't know and they don't have the expertise to set up these kinds of systems. So when we're when the focus is uh, around drone delivery is often on um, what the what the individual drones are doing or what that might be like in in your neighbourhood. I think our one of the key areas for further research and critical attention is around the way standards are being um, captured and the way regulation might be being captured and what the consequences are in terms of where power resides and where public agency is around the transformation of skyway. Ways, um, in a future in which um, in which they are controlled through automated systems. Thanks very much. From herds to swarms. Um, thank you so much for such an interesting set of provocations. Uh, we have a few minutes left for some questions. Would anybody like to get the ball rolling? No, I think, is that Lauren? Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Lauren Kelly. I'm a PhD candidate here at RMIT. It was such a great panel and I have questions for everyone, but I'm not allowed. So I'll just have <laughs> one question for Michael instead. And maybe it's a big one, so maybe we can talk about it more later. Um, so I also research rapid grocery deliveries and the like the kind of uh, labor relations of the supermarket broadly in the stores and the dark stores and in the warehouses. And now we've got drones to contend with as well. Um, my own pre preliminary research shows that the more rapid the delivery is, usually the more trivial the things are that are being ordered. And so this really puts a dent in the big supermarkets claims that they're providing kind of essential service for vulnerable communities, right? What do you think the end goal really is, particularly with the Coles wing partnership because it's not delivering Vegemite right there's no money in that like what do you think actually the end goal is and do you think that um you know there's there's some kind of strategy in testing these technologies using something as banal as groceries because they're completely inoffensive and they don't really get people's shackles up and they kind of fly under the radar pardon the pun but yeah what do you think the end goal is there uh it's a Great question. Thanks, Lauren. And yeah, we should definitely talk um, more. Um, I've been thinking about resonances with your work, actually. And so um, I think it's hard to know, uh, other than that, um, I wonder if Coles isn't trying to get into the sort of same um, speculative experimental space of trying out stuff with technology and seeing what develops and what transpires and what becomes possible. Um, at the moment, the limitations on this amount of weight that can be delivered are pretty significant, but we could imagine, um, uh, you know, a not too distant future potentially where like the, those unmanned um, infrastructure systems for traffic management are much more robust, um, where um, drone delivery becomes more normalized and where the drone technologies themselves are able to carry larger um, package weights. And so going like yeah you know delivering like less than a kilo of or less than 1.5 kilos of um goods is like not very um cost efficient and it raises all these questions about like well, what are we really paying for here and what's what's the price socially of convenience um but uh you know if that increases to 10 kilograms does it maybe become more viable then 
Um, and are there like areas, are there places where um, permission will be granted um, for, for uh, larger packages and bigger types of delivery earlier? Like um, Anthony and I were talking yesterday a little bit about this in rural spaces and you could imagine authorization for much larger drones, which do already exist, that could carry much larger payloads across longer distances um, where it could become um, uh, more financially viable um, to do it, but there are a whole load of costs and consequences for that as well. So it's possible that they're looking to try to get into that that space too of like how do we do it in in um, in more far flung areas and with larger payloads. Anthony and then Christine. Yeah. Sorry. Um, hi, Anthony McCosker um, at Swinburne University. Uh, I think this is a question for anyone because I think um, across all of your projects, um, there's a real tension between, or tension in the way that communities or people or those who the technologies are being applied to or in on behalf of are included in the process of either design or rollout or use or development or deployment or whatever. Um, and sometimes, of course, it's in Michael's case, they're not really the object um, that is the argument that you're making. I think it was a bit more explicit in your paper, Justine. Um, so just wondering if if anyone can can make a comment about, I don't know, what are the mechanisms for um, for improving the way that communities are, are connected with with these kind of, of projects um, from the speculative you know, side to, to actually getting at what the needs are that these technologies really address? Um, open question. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was waiting for the microphone and suddenly realized I don't need to wait. <laughs> Uh, yeah, look, um, maybe I'll just say a quick, a quick response and I'd, I'd be happy to, yeah, Rob's also got a comment he'd like to make uh, and a really good question. And I do think that one of linking back to the uh, previous question, there is a, a really long history of uh, rationalising the rollout of new technologies um, on the basis of um, providing benefits or including communities, populations that um, might otherwise be excluded from society. And I think that part of that is about building, I mean, to use kind of Callon's theory of translation, building uh, a social license, but also a kind of a passage point for these technologies to be ushered in. And in addition to that, uh, a lot of marginalised communities are, are at the forefront, partly because of that, um, of the use of those technologies or being subject to them and the extent to which they're being invited or uh, that there's an interest in their actual needs, um, I, I think is a, a question that is sometimes um, not, there's no, the, the, the answer is that the, the, the interest lies elsewhere, not in addressing the needs of those communities, but I do think there are Definitely, um, particularly with street furniture, many opportunities for incorporating the imaginations of, of, of other groups, including marginalised users of those technologies, but potentially of other groups as well, um, into the sort of design process and the uh, implementation of, of, for example, street furniture, but it could just as easily be drones. Uh, and the outcomes of that might be completely different. You know, what that looks like, uh, I mean, if you look at the kind of the payphone and how that's being repurposed in a whole variety of ways, um, what it is, what it could be, it's not written in stone. And, uh, you know, really now's the point where we could be thinking about, well, you know, what are the kinds of technologies we want in urban spaces? And who do we want them to address and to help? Um, can I just say, I mean, I think that's a really hard question and it's not just an academic or an intellectual question because you could, I mean, if I could, you know, say I answered it now, the world wouldn't change. <laughs> you know, what we need, uh, what people need in order to exercise power 
uh, in relation to these technologies is, is not just new ideas, but it, it's you know, political power. Uh, and I, but one of the reasons why this is a hard question is it really raises uh, questions about people's willingness to reinvest in democracy and reinvest in democracy in relation to technological trajectories. And some of what's required to, uh, to do that would require uh, a, a willingness to address political questions at the level of the whole community, uh, not just at the, the level of kind of a, a micro politics, and then to either regulate or to take direct action. Uh, so it, it seems to me genuine, a genuine democratic politics about technology is very radical program very radical program i think people are often not actually willing to confront that uh, you know we all uh, now what in effect happens i think is people impose themselves as sort of translators or white sages you know let me speak on behalf of the, you know the pigs or let me speak on behalf of some marginalized community and represent them through you know corporate and bureaucratic processes in ways that pretend that we're taking people's needs into account. But that's, that's very different from people actually having a say, uh, say themselves. Uh, and I, I do think people should bang their heads against that, uh, that problem. We should be imagining a politics uh, where the community had a genuine say uh, in questions about what the technological future looks like. I just add one quick thought to that. I mean, obviously that's a complicated question in any context, but it's radically more complicated if you're dealing with planetary scale monitoring and uh, intervention. And obviously the constituencies are not just human either. But I mean, just to be very prosaic, the audience of this paper is the UN and specifically its sustainable development goals. And so the UN is being figured in this paper as a kind of, you know, uh, representative of humanity and so that's the demos that's sort of being invoked here and obviously we know that the UN and its relations to big tech companies are you know growing and complicated so I would just say yeah that is not to answer the question except to say that's who's being invoked in this particular imagining when um uh when we first rolled out drone delivery in Canberra, they rolled it out in Bonathon, which is a um, sort of more middle class um, kind of area with um, uh, with a fairly cohesive community. And the response was pretty swift and negative um, and very organized. And um, uh, it seems they were quite overwhelmed by how quickly um, people were able to leverage um, uh, um, local government and regulation and um, community action to force um, uh, to make it very uncomfortable to run the trials there. And so rather than kind of um, retool and, and re-engage at a kind of consultative level and attempt to kind of do what I, perhaps what you're trying to get at, Anthony, is they, they then just moved <laughs> the operations to, to a different area, um, Mitchell, which is um, uh, more diverse, um, more, more mixed use, more industrial space there. Uh, and, and they just ran it in a more atomized um, environment. Um, and I think that's quite interesting too about what's, what's going on here. Um, but um, but I think that like in the drone delivery stuff, and I think this is true in a lot of spaces right now, there, is, we, there we are in this kind of um, uh, developmental stage before things actually get entrenched and embedded. And so it is important to find what those like sites of um, better consultation or more resistance or, um, or more engaged public response are before um, all the capture hatch happens and before the things get set down in a way that is not that is not responsive to what people want or don't want um and i think like that's one of the things that we're really interested in in, in developing this work over the next little while is to try and kind of think about that um rather than just like the badness of what might be happening with particular aspects of it christine had a question Hi, thanks for um, it's such a wonderful panel. And uh, I'm Christine Parker from Melbourne Law School and a CI with the ADMS. And I am responsible for the ecological impact of ADM projects. So, and also very interested in um, non-human animals and ADMs. So um, hopefully we'll have more conversation. Um, my 
question was kind of like Anthony's, I guess. Um, and I might just tie it particularly to James's paper, which was fantastic, um, and and what Michael had to say, because I sensed a bit of a tension there in one sense in that, um, James, you were sort of saying, well, this is an, this listening everywhere and bringing the environmentalists into this sort of governmentality um, is an imperialist project where we're... Um, the AI scientific industry is essentially colonizing wild spaces and and, and so on and um, and in the drone case it's colonizing aerial spaces that were not previously colonized um, and I don't I'm not meaning to <laughs> set up a great conflict there but I think when we were just talking a moment ago Michael and when when you set it up you were sort of talking about property rights and regulation and so on and of course we know that what happens is we start talking about regulation and although we have all the best democratic um will and motivation in the world whatever we do with regulation it ends up getting captured and ends up naturalizing um something that perhaps we don't want so i guess um my question is just the very basic radical question is it possible to keep spaces free of this human interference and technology at all? Are there places um, that, that we want free of that? Or is there some other way of, of thinking about this? Um, and I guess I'll, you know, I'm particularly motivated by animal issues. And so I feel like, you know, shouldn't the ravens have a right to that airspace? Um, uh, and to get rid of us humans from having our beer quickly delivered or whatever it is. Anyway, that's my question. Ravens have parliaments, so perhaps, oh! uh, perhaps they should. Um, yeah, too well. Uh, um, yeah, look, I, I won't say much except to say, yeah, I agree. And like, if, you know, my personal view on this would be um, that drone delivery is like generally a really terrible idea, actually. And um, we should be reserving it for very specific uses like um, emergency delivery of medical supplies to remote locations, um, disaster response, et cetera. And we should not be um, be implementing it more broadly. Um, but we there are spaces that have been chosen to be um, distinct from um, these types of uh, um, technologies. Um, on the one hand, like military spaces and airports and so on are all strictly regulated about, um, about airspace, but so too are national parks um, and other types of zones. And in fact, to fly a drone in a national park, you need to go through a, a permit process. Um, if there's um, uh, um, First Nations people um, living in, in areas so that the drones will be over, it's even more complicated. Um, and so there are, but like, but so there are models for a much more restrictive um, approach, um, but uh, they're not the ones that are dominant within um, suburban spaces. Can I, sorry, can I make, there's a really obvious point here, which is that we have to be really careful not to mobilise the figure of a pre-human nature in Australia in particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, we, could, we yeah. could get rid of all of these Absolutely. technologies and we would still be dealing with a landscape that has been shaped by 40,000 years of, of human environmental engineering. Yeah. So, um, you know, that, that notion that there is a kind of animal world, uh, you know, uh, uh, an ecosystem in Australia that's not already shaped by human contact. It's not one that we should be taking up here. I mean, that is basically why I... <laughs> Uh, made the move at the end, which I'd love to have done in more detail to decenter AI. Because if you put this in the context of like colonial history, it's like, oh, surprise, surprise, science and capital have been working alongside each other the whole time to do, <laughs> you know, the colonizing. So yeah, I mean, that basic move is, is important. I mean, in this case, what I didn't say, because I sort of think the audience take it, takes it for red, is this will absolutely definitely not work. Like there is no possibility of this working. They, the, the, the paper that they used to cite for the idea that we could have alarm systems for animals is one study written by the author of this paper involving 15 border collies, <laughs> right? So like, it definitely won't work. 
so I'm not worried about it uh, colonizing, you know, auditory space. I'm worried about the scientific imaginary mm -hmm. and the relationship between people like this guy and his buddies that I imagine to exist at the UN. And, you know, like, what are the what are going to be the consequences of it like massively failing to work <laughs> uh, and you know that whatever like weird little inroads it does get so i don't i think the imagination is absolutely colonial <laughs> and imperial but i don't i'm the worry here for me is not like total global auditory capture it's something other than that which might not be less disturbing I, just picking up on that we have a comment in the chat from luke Mann. um uh he observes some of the things we've been talking about assume that text claims are true whereas uh, a lot of research has demonstrated that ai and machine systems are broken dysfunctional or underwhelming tech rhetoric shouldn't be taken at face value and this means that something is happening colonization of work skies public space etc but not what is being claimed and that that raises an interesting uh jason you want to chime in on that <laughs> yeah i was not i was uh deciding to ask my question or not but then based on what uh james and luke just said it was exactly what i was thinking is i, I mean yeah i don't i think things like wing are a peculiarity right like these these things are going to fail i mean we already see a lot of this failing with like milk run or gitter or whatever right like these things are flashes in the pan but that doesn't mean they're not important i think the question for me is what's the aftermath of that of that look like what's the aftermath of those logics or the politics or the projects we've been hearing about in this wonderful panel a lot of which will fail um but uh it won't go away and it won't fail as if it just never existed there will be an aftermath and we we are always living in the aftermath of failed projects, failed regimes, failed politics, failed utopias, right? Like that's where real reality and real dystopia is found is in the aftermath of failed utopias. Like George Orwell is not who we should be reaching for when we're thinking about the imaginaries or reference points. I always say it's, you know, it's Philip K. Dick or it's Paul Verhoeven. That's who we should be reaching for, right? Because those are pictures of a world where these kinds of pro pro uh, projects and politics that we're hearing about today tried where it were tried to be implemented and they fell right that's what the world then looks like in the aftermath of that failure so can i hear people i want to hear more about we've been hearing a lot of great case studies and analysis but what's the aftermath look like so yeah. some of this stuff isn't going to fail what um and, and uh, there's a problem when humanity scholars respond to engineers by saying that'll never work so I, I mean i do you're absolutely right most of it will fail <laughs> maybe but not all of it and there, there is this you know there's this embarrassing history of people saying what computers won't be able to do you know all the people reading heidegger all the people reading people like me reading philosophy say oh the machines will never be able to do that and lo and behold now we're living with machines that that do do a, a lot of it um so one it's important to acknowledge that point that these are flawed projects and as you say most of it will fail but without you know pinning your <laughs> hopes on the idea that none of it will ever work the other thing to say is often the applications are straightforwardly military you know the the auditory you know the machine listening uh that that's military applications probably a lot of the drone delivery stuff is really uh, military so there's some some of this stuff is a, is the failure in the civilian applications uh, is the surveillance technologies and the military uh, military applications. And on that rather somber note, I, I think we will oh, wrap up. We can't leave. <laughs> we can't, can't leave it. <laughs> the aftermath, something to, something to um, study. Uh, I, I think we've got a pretty tight lunch window. So I, I'm I do want to, I'm afraid we will wrap it up on that, but can we give a round of applause to our um, panel? Thanks so much. <laughs>